life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Welcome to Camaraderie, a subsidiary of Freddie Westman Enterprises. Today's episode is sponsored by the Ohio River Scenic Byways Committee for the Reduction of Traveling Through Endless Cornfields on the Way to Chicago. So a few weeks ago, me and my brother Clint drove up to Elmhurst, Illinois to attend the 17th edition of the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. Pretty much the same idea as last year. Spend a couple days exhibiting and recording and chatting and hanging out with a similarly minded group of retro tech enthusiasts and then just make our way into Chicago and hang out there for a few days and just just, just do stuff in Chicago. So that's what that's what this video is. And along the way while we're taking in the sights and sounds and smells of the city, I would was planning to just blow through a bunch of film like way too much, like like way too much, much much. Uh, like 30 rolls, almost. Alright, I think I might have brought too much film? What is this? But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, this is gonna be a fairly long video, so... Grab your favorite bevy. Sink into your third favorite chair. And enjoy the ride, or have a good time, or whatever. Speaking of ride, the ride up was quite long. It was about a 12 hour trip from North Carolina to Illinois once you account for gas stops, food stops, and messing around with the GoPro stops. We took a slightly different route this time and we were able to skip over a fair amount of the massively monotonous meadows of maize courtesy of the Ohio River Scenic Byway. With all that out of the way, it was time to get our bearings, get some beef, and get some sleep. Because we had a long weekend ahead of us. Oh, you can get a... I might have to get a side of gravy. Extra gravy. After setting up Clint's table on Friday and getting a lay of the land and making a game plan for how we were going to approach shooting the event, we had some downtime, so we headed to Galloping Ghost Arcade. Now, it was sensory overload, but kind of in the best way. You walk in, pay a flat rate of 25 bucks, and you can play as many of the 900 or so games as you want. Kind of overwhelming, to be honest, at first, but once you get your head wrapped around <laughs> everything, it's just so much fun. There's an absolute buttload of stuff that I've never heard of. Well, I mean, obviously uh, there's like 900 games there, but there's also stuff I've never gotten a chance to play, but I've always wanted to, like the Star Wars Pod Racer game, which was just an absolute blast. As well as unheard of gems that quickly became a favorite for both me and Clint, like Metamorphic Force, which is a homoerotic beat-em-up filled with vibrant colors and furry beefcake heroes. What more can you ask for? We got there around 2.30 or so in the afternoon, and the next thing you know, it's after 7, and the sun's going down, so we actually missed our dinner plans with the VCF folks. As much of a good time as that first night before the show dinner is with everyone, I'm really glad we hadn't eaten supper yet because, uh... Uh, it would have been making an encore appearance once we got our hands on the Sega R360. So after checking out the pinball building of Galloping Ghost, a couple random dudes on the sidewalk were like, Hey, you're LGR, right? Do you want to follow us into the back of an abandoned Chinese restaurant? We've got an 8 foot tall Japanese behemoth of a game that needs its own electrical breaker to operate. And of course we were like, yeah, no, that sounds great. I'd never heard of the Sega R360. Uh, Clint had, obviously, because 
he's a giant dork. But it's basically a giant mechanized spinning ball that can simulate things like flying jets. I would imagine they have other games for it, but I, you know, that's all we, that's all they had. Um, it's just absolutely wild. It's so much fun. And I guess you could say that thanks to those two guys, Brandon and Phil, we had a ball. Because it's, it's kind of a ball. You know, it's sort of, a, you know, it's spherical. It's not really a ball, you know, you can... After we did pretty well on our constitution saving throws, it was back to the Clarion in Waterford Convention Center to make sure that everything was in place and ready to go for the next day. I have a couple tasty local brews supplied by some of the other exhibitors. Just kind of hang out, check out some machines, and just, you know, just wait for the madness to start. Now, last year's festival was a lot of fun, and this year was no different. I mean, it, it, it was a lot different. I'm just saying that it was also fun this year. Plus, I had a much better idea of what to expect from a filming standpoint. For instance, we just completely forgot to get establishing shots of the venue or of Clint's table last year, which left us feeling rather silly. And there was no silliness to be had this year, no sir. Otherwise, my second VCFNW experience was an absolute belter. Met up with just about everybody I ran into last year and met loads of awesome new people and ogled all of the exhibits with my eyeballs because that's usually what you ogle things with, right? Some personal favorites were the Apple Lisa, the Weather Channel computers, the Ansa phone, and the Topo robots. I wish they could have a demo or something of them moving around and doing robot things, but I, I get why that's impractical at an event of this size and with this many people. It was also cool to see just how many people had cameras at the show, like uh, weird cameras, like uh, everything from a 16 millimeter like movie film camera to uh, all sorts of different Mavicas. There weren't really any of those last year, but I had a Mavica um, that I've seen once with like 20x optical zoom and you know, there's a <laughs> surprising amount of Mavicas there. And uh, there's also the weird 3D camera that um, Mac from Steve... <laughs> Steve... <laughs> Mac from Steve84. Steve from Mac84 had this weird little like early digital 3D camera um, that was the Fujifilm Fine Pix Real 3DW3 which just really rolls off the tongue. But I guess it just kind of goes to show that there's a surprising amount of overlap between these two fields of interest. I guess some people just like inconvenient and expensive hobbies. If you want to see more of a vintage computer festival Midwest-centric video, be sure to check out uh, LGR's video. It's still sound, I don't know, LGR's cleanse. Check out the video in the description or well there's a link to it in the description or um, if I remember to put one up top there's one up top as well for now let's get to Chicago or er, uh, Oak Park rather after a long weekend of retro computer action we settled in at the Carlton Inn of Oak Park <laughs> <laughs> we wound up getting rooms in the wing of the building that was originally built for the Columbian Exposition in 1893, which I think is pretty neat. We were pretty beat after exhibiting for a few days, so we just grabbed some food at Poor Phil's, which was the hotel's on-site pub, and explored a little bit of Oak Park. But then we just turned in for the night. First things first, after breakfast, we activated our Ventra cards for a three-day L Pass, which I think it was only like 20 bucks or something. Uh, that's way cheaper than any ride-sharing service or cab going into and around town. 
and it allowed us to not have to worry about driving in or finding parking in the city. Luckily, the green line ends, uh, or starts I guess, depending on how you look at it, at the Harleman Lake Station, just a block or two down from the Carlton. I'm a huge fan of public transit, good public transit, and I think that the L takes the W, at least compared to my admittedly limited experiences with the metro lines in uh, LA and DC. Regardless of which system is quote unquote better, it's definitely something I wish more cities took advantage of rather than being designed around car access with public transit, either a total afterthought or just completely unreliable. So we hopped on at Harlem and Lake and 30 minutes later we got off at Adams and Wabash right where we wanted to start off our adventures in the Windy City. So these first couple stops, because of odd operating hours enforced by the pandemic, we completely missed out on these the last time that we were up here, and we wanted to make sure that we got them in this go around because they still have those weird operating hours, but hmm. not even a block from the Adams and Wabash stop is Central Camera in operation since 1899. I want to say it's my favorite camera store that I've ever been to. And don't get me wrong, Sammy's camera in LA is outstanding, but I think Central Camera is just a little bit more my speed. If you saw Clint's video about E3 2019, you might remember me being absolutely gobsmacked by the selection of film stocks available at Sammy's. But they're also like a total one-stop shop for movie productions with Ari Alexas and car hood mounts and lighting rigs for rent and whatnot. It, I mean, it's LA after all. Whereas in contrast, Central Camera is just like a really well-equipped neighborhood camera store. I picked up several rolls of Kodak Ultramax 400 for my Nikon F2 since that stuff is basically always out of stock everywhere I look, as well as a good handful of 120 film for my Pentax 645. That's right, your boy finally took the plunge into medium format. And yes, there will be videos on that thing in the near future. And I also picked up some merch and a vintage leather camera strap. So basically I just spent way too much money there, but it's all good. From there, the only other thing that we really had planned out for this entire trip was to hit up the Art Institute of Chicago, notable for its inclusion in John Hughes' seminal work, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and there is absolutely nothing else remarkable about it. didn't end up shooting any film in the museum because the telephoto on my F2 seemed impractical, and I'm pretty sure the shutter slap from my 645 would have damaged a priceless piece of art, but Clint documented some of the experience on his GoPro. I love art in general, but you can find Renaissance paintings in pretty much any museum and they all start to look the same to me after a while. And there's only so many Madonna and Childs that a guy can take. Thankfully, there was no shortage of other awesome stuff to see, from Parks to Picasso. Two exhibits in particular stood out to me because I've frankly never seen anything like them in any other museum. First, we had the Deering Family Galleries of Medieval and Renaissance Art, Arms, and Armor. I mean, this sword is taller than me, and I'm 6'3". As someone who grew up with a borderline bonkers obsession with medieval arms and whatnot, it was super fascinating to see the history of armor from different civilizations and the progression of techniques and technology from century to century. And the other exhibit that really left an impression on me was the Thorn Rooms. Back in the 1930s, Narcissa Niblack Thorne hired a bunch, that's a mouthful of a name, she hired a bunch of craftspeople to make these 1 to 12 scale interior spaces as a means of providing employment to artists during the Great Depression. It's actually ridiculous the amount of detail that they were able to get into these tiny little spaces and with how they treat lighting. It can almost 
be it, it is disorienting to look at these and realize that they're not much bigger than like a box of printer paper. Now we didn't get to all of the museum. I mean, even the VMFA here in Richmond, it took me and Selena like three full days of visiting to properly absorb it all. And uh, yeah, the Art Institute is certainly more expansive than that. And plus after several hours in a museum, I don't know about y'all, but for me, I, my mind is usually just spent. Like there's, it's a different kind of uh, sensory overload, like too much input. But you know, after a few hours, it's uh, time to move on. So it was back out into the fresh air and we were like, well, that's basically what we had planned for the trip. What do you want to do for the next two and a half days? And to quote one Anakin Skywalker, this is where the fun begins. One of my greatest pleasures in life is simply wandering around, seeing what I see and deciding spur of the moment to do stuff that I want to do and go where I want to go. We didn't make it to Millennium Park last time around, and that was right down the road from the Art Institute. So yeah, there we went. You better believe that I flicked the bean. By this point, it was getting to be kind of late afternoonish, and we were pretty hungry, and I was finally able to experience Nando's. I hear so much about it from all the UK content I consume, and it definitely lived up to the hype I've built in my head. That peri peri chicken, man. Mm. From there, we found our way to where they start the riverboat architecture tours. So we decided to hop on and enjoy the city from a different perspective. Now, last time we got the Sears Tower glass box experience, so I guess this was basically the opposite of that.
And afterwards, guess what we did? We walked around some more. A lot of our trip actually kind of ended up just being us walking around. <laughs> Between my smartwatch and the stats on Clint's phone, we walked somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 miles across our three days in Chicago. And that's not even counting the running about and whatnot that we did at BCF. There's so much to take in though that I really didn't feel like I walked that far until we hopped back on the green line back to Oak Park. It's only when you stop that you notice just how much dogs are barking. But that was day one in the books. Day th five or something of the actual, of the whole trip? I don't know. The first day in Chicago in the books. And the next day we, it was a little bit more leisurely you know, we didn't have to make sure that we were getting to the museum or getting to the camera store, which is good because they were both closed on that Tuesday and that Wednesday. Like I said, their hours are weird now. Just make sure you look up their hours if you're interested in visiting. We found our way to, uh, I forget, I think it's actually just called Untitled by Picasso. It's a whole little plaza kind of centered around this massive Picasso sculpture, which is pretty neat. We visited this last time. We saw this last time, but it's still just, <laughs> I don't know. How often do you get to just see a Picasso sculpture in, in, that's massive in the middle of a city? I guess if you live in Chicago or work there, you probably get to see it pretty often, but you know, we don't do either of those things. So, plus it made for some good pigeon watching. It was getting to be around two o'clock or so in the afternoon and we, I, I should say, I wanted to make sure to catch the Champions League match between Liverpool and Ajax. So we made our way to Theory. It's a little like, yeah, bar, restaurant, pub, lounge thing that had a million TVs. So it was kind of nice to kick back and just be a couple of bros watching some sports and uh, yeah, not have to walk around for a couple hours. But then we did start walking around again and we made our way to uh, this beach close to Navy Pier. can't remember what the name of it is and I don't feel like looking it up. I I didn't write it in my script. You expect me to look up things mid video? No, I don't think so. I don't, I don't expect anything from me, much less doing work. And since we didn't have anywhere to be or anything to do the next day, we stayed out a little bit longer and got some good nighttime walking in. Gotta put that Cinestill 800T to use, you know? I mean, like that's what it's for. Cities at night. Hellations.
I also had some Delta 3200 and some T-Max P3200 that I was shooting. And uh, I can't remember, I did not keep a good log of when I shot what. Uh, so I can't remember if some of these shots are from this night or the next night, but you get the idea. Nighttime walk arounds, see some cool city stuff. We had a very educational train ride back to Oak Park, and then we just kind of turned in for the night. You know, just hung out, just being a couple bros, because that's what, we, that's what we are. We're bros, bro. So we just broed out for a little bit, and you know, just kind of just. I don't know how to transition to the next day, man. This is it's the next day. There it is. Transition done. This was our last day in Chicago. The last full day of our trip. It's very sad, but it was a full day. We didn't have to just jet off back to, or well, drive off back to North Carolina yet. And so the first thing that we did after getting some brekkie was checking out just a bunch of Frank Lloyd Wright houses. We didn't go on a tour, but we were just like walking around this neighborhood and there's like four or five or six of them or something right in this area. And that's so cool. I, I love that about Chicago. I, Frank Lloyd Wright, I wish I could bring him back and have them design a house for me because I don't know, just they just look different, man. All the houses up there look pretty cool. Well, not all of them, obviously, but like a lot of the architectural styles that they employ in their neighborhoods in Chicago, in and around Chicago, it's something they're they're pretty cool. But like, there's something different about the way Frank Lloyd Wright interpreted architecture it's just yeah so it's really cool to see that in person i don't think i've seen any frank lloyd wright stuff like in in person with my own eyeballs so that was a lot of fun once we actually got into the city uh we you know just you know the drill by now just more wandering around doing stuff And uh, one of the things that we came across was this huge, huge, massive fountain. You want to know why they made it? Because they can. And they did. And it's really old. I think, I don't think that was a Columbian Exposition thing, but is very, very old and very, very large. There's also some gardens there. There's just like gardens and parks and stuff throughout the city, man. It's just what Chicago does. I think the whole like city beautiful movement, I think is what it's called, is like the whole idea was that people would never be more than like six blocks from a green space. I just the way they designed Chicago is fantastic because you just get all this green space in the middle of this like metropolis and also, also their alleyways. Their alleyways, I think, are like minimum 16 feet wide. I may have my stats wrong. I didn't write this one down either. Minimum 16 feet between buildings in the alleyways. And that's so that you just don't get like a bunch of dumpsters and stuff on the sidewalks. Like they're all kind of tucked and hidden away and everything. And plus it just makes for some really cool shots getting these like alley, I don't know, alleyways are cool. I like them. And for our last meal in Chicago, we got some Giordano's, man. We had our Italian beef. We had other things to eat. <laughs> and uh, we got some, this wasn't a deep dish pizza, but it was like a Parmesan crusted something or other kind of pizza. It's really, really good though, man. Ugh. Take me back to Giordano's. I want some Giordano's.
after Giordano's, you know, we just kept getting our steps in, so, you know, why not? We're only here for another night, so we got some more nighttime walkabouts in, and yeah. Now I just love the way this city looks at night. Then the morning after came. It was time to go back down the Ohio River Scenic Byway and back through... Wait, did we go through Indianapolis? We didn't go through Lexington. I think we went through Louisville. I don't know, man. We went back down south and here we are now. Here I am now. He, Clint's... <laughs> How crazy would that be if I just turned the camera and there he is for this entire time listening to me stumble through all of this. That's about it for this video, man. Chicago is just such a cool place. If I could live somewhere like Oak Park, that would be pretty tight and just hop on the train whenever I need to or want to go into town. I just appreciate so much about the things that Chicago has chosen to be. It's a great city and I immediately once i got all of my film developed and processed and scanned and everything it took me i would have to ask selena but i think i was pretty much just in the kitchen developing and in my office right over here scanning for it was probably i think it might have been close to a full work week there was 28 rolls of film to fully process. And by golly, I did. I did it. I did it. And upon seeing my scans, I was like, man, I wish I could do this again right now because I don't know. I didn't know what I was doing with the Pentax 645. Like I got some good shots with it, sure. But like, uh, so I'll talk about this whenever I make a video about it, but like, the focusing screen that it came with, I got it used obviously because it's like f almost 40 years old now, but um, the focusing screen it came with is just a flat, just nothing. There's no focusing aids, like other than just using your eyeballs. I mean, I also lost my glasses when I went to the beach a couple weeks ago, or a couple weeks, oh, like a week before we went up to Chicago. I lost my glasses in the ocean, so I'm wearing like a 10 year old pair of glasses right now and it's just a mess, it's a mess. So I don't know, I, I'm also not super familiar with scanning 120 film at home. So like there's a lot of variables, but all of that to say, I wasn't super happy with how a lot of the medium format stuff came out. I think it's, it's a different, um, it's just different. I just need time with it. But I had a great time with it regardless in Chicago, even if I'm not a huge fan of how some of the pictures turned out. Yeah, I'll have to get a different focusing screen for the Pentax 645 and hopefully hopefully that'll make my pictures better so I can actually see what I'm focusing on. And also I need to get some more glasses, but you know. 
Uh, let's blame the equipment and not me. Thanks again to Clint for having me along, man. It's a blast. It's a good time. Always is. Same time again next year, probably. Just wanted to say thanks again to Jim Leonard and the rest of the people who put on VCF Midwest. It's such an awesome time. Thank you for letting me come along with Clint and document everything. And uh, it's just a really cool convention and I'm, I'm happy to be able to go there two years in a row and hopefully next year we'll make it three in a row. I'd also like to thank everybody that took some time out of their conventioning to say hello to me. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces from last year and also meet some new people. You guys, you guys are good people, man. Like, I don't know what to say. I didn't script this part out. <laughs> Thanks for showing me a good time in Elmhurst, Illinois, and also in Oak Park in Chicago, but they weren't there. Other people. All right. Uh, this is, this video is done. Thanks for watching. I'll be on this side of the lens in the next video. So until then, see ya.